God of the covenant, in our baptisms, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles, that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, 
but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter the house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. on miracles, and I did, kind of, sort of, but the events of the week before distracted me. The texts were so rich and good. If you remember, Jesus returned a little girl thought to be dead back to life, and while he was at it, almost as an aside, heals a woman who has been hemorrhaging for years. It was a busy day for Jesus. As we pick up the story in today's gospel, things have taken a terrible turn. Jesus makes the horrific mistake of agreeing to be the guest preacher in his hometown synagogue. Being a preacher sometimes can be a tough business. Say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, and the first thing people want to do is run you out of town. I thought about this week when I ran across the strange case of Tulian Chavidian. Actually, this wasn't so strange. It happens all the time. To put it gently, if you remember, Tertullian was the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale. The last time I talked about him, I described him as a stud who knew it. Tanned, muscled, tight shirts, torn jeans, big, perfect smile. He could have been a model. I referenced him in a Reformation sermon two or so years ago because of the two tattoos that he had. On one arm, he had written in Greek to confuse all the most tenacious, Simo Ustis, and on the other, Rakata. Uh, it means literally, simultaneously, just at the same time, sinner and saint. Remember how I told you that I first noticed it while I was watching one of his podcasts, and because he waves his arms a lot like his grandfather, Billy Graham, and my Greek is in such a shambles, it took me forever to slow down the feed long enough to see what the tats really said, and then to get out the dictionary and discover what they meant. Apparently, like so many preachers, Chibidian gave in to his Epicotro son. <laughs> and he got involved in some kind of extramarital relations and was forced to resign. Now, I'm not here to beat up on the guy for that. After all, stud muffins will be stud muffins. <laughs> I was more fascinated to see what happened to the guy afterwards. I liked him, make no mistake about it. I liked him. He was a solid theologian who preached biblically based almost Lutheran sermons. So I followed him on Facebook and occasionally watched a podcast when I had 45 minutes to spare. For as Pastor McGuire can tell you from his firsthand experience over his Easter vacation, 
Chividian could be a bit long-winded. Shortly after, I read the article of his resignation on the Washington Post website, the guy disappeared. Gone was his Facebook account where I'd seen a post only the night before. Gone was his Twitter feed. Gone was his blog. Gone were all of his sermons from the church's website. It was like he vanished into thin air. It reminded me, remember of those old days in the Soviet Union when a leader who had fallen out of favor would catch a cold? And the next thing anybody knew, his body was riding on a cortege through Red Square while pictures and statues were being removed from state offices and any hint of him was being taken out of Soviet history. It just seemed that way. Chavidian had a history. He was the grandson of Billy Graham. Now, he has an embarrassing period that will become part of his history. No matter what he does, no matter where he goes, he will not be able to pass off this history with even a wave of the hand. Jesus, too, had a history, and that history caused him problems when he stood up to speak that day in the synagogue. Mark doesn't say it, as Matthew and Luke do. He doesn't say that Jesus made any extravagant claims for himself. He didn't compare himself to a prophet or the fulfillment of all prophecy. He just spoke eloquently. I love the way Eugene Lowry paraphrases this scene in the message. He has the people saying, we had no idea he was that good. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such abilities? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. They tripped over what they knew about him and fell and never got any further. Isn't that how it is? People remember some moment in your inglorious past, some moment when you weren't at your best and simply can't get over it. They think about who you were rather than who you are. They think of you as the little kid playing down the block and never concede that over the years you might have become not only older, but perhaps maybe even a little wiser. For those of us whose lives will never make a mention in the Washington Post, and for some of us that's a thank God proposition, these kinds of things can stop us in our tracks. And they can stop us from being the people Jesus wants us to be. It's important to note in the reading that Jesus doesn't sling from public opinion. He isn't even deterred by it. Instead of slinking back, he, he expands his ministry. And then he does something that's purely crazy. He sends the disciples out, two by two, to try his hand at what he has been trying. He gives them some specific instructions. And some terrific advice. He says, if you come to a town where people do not welcome you or will not listen to you, leave it. Shake the dust off your feet. That will be a warning to them. It will warn them that in the words of Ezekiel, they are a rebellious house and that no good will come of their rebellion against God. However, you have to hear what the disciples did while they were out preaching. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. 
right and left, they sent demons packing and brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. The disciples did what Jesus couldn't do in his hometown. They drove out demons and healed the sick. Maybe they were able to do that because to their listeners, their lives was a blank slate. Maybe they both literally and figuratively did not have any baggage, so the people gave them a hearing. Maybe the reason Jesus was unable to heal very many in his hometown was because so few of them came for healing. They had this preconceived notion. Carpenters don't heal people. They build things. This is Mary's boy. We know his family. He has no special powers. Maybe that's how the church still sees Jesus. Lutherans, and I would say a lot of folks in the Reformed tradition, love miracle stories. We really love them. But we also really don't quite know what to do with them in our lives. Certainly, Jesus could work miracles in Scripture. No one doubts that. But can he do it for me? Us? Now? Not so sure. Here's what I think. I think Jesus is still doing miracles all around us all the time. But we're a little like the people in Jesus' hometown. We want them to be explained away. A lucky break, a smart deal, hard work. But ask anybody who has ever been on the verge of losing their life to drugs or alcohol, but who have now become solid citizens, and they won't talk about what happened as luck, they will tell you that it is nothing less than a miracle. Ask anybody who has been on the brink of financial disaster but bounced back, and they will tell you that in their case, sometimes brains and brawn and smarts were turned into a miracle. Ask anybody who has been in a destructive relationship or no relationship at all, but who somehow, some way found one. And, and they won't point to ChristianMingles.com. They'll tell you it was a miracle. Ask some of us what went on in the hearts and minds of five justices this past week. And they will tell you that even though it was a long time coming, it was still a miracle. It is my prayer that someday the tattooed, arm waving, full of himself, well tanned, and unbuttoned preacher with the weird last name will find a way back from his fall and be accepted by people who really know that in God's eyes they are both sinners and saints. And when he is, I'll bet, I'll just bet that he'll tell you it's a miracle. Thanks for listening.
live simply, love generously, speak truthfully, serve faithfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you this day and always. Oh.